Morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Torbjörn Ludén, and I'm the head of the Stockholm China Center. I want to welcome you all to this lecture about Hong Kong, which is part of the ISDP's Hong Kong project. In particular, I wish to welcome today's speaker, Mr. Wing Tat Lee, who is now living in London. It's a great honor to have you with us today, Mr. Lee. And yes, I also wish to, to welcome my colleague, Professor Joseph Isek Cheng, <coughs> who is now living in New Zealand, who will moderate today's event. Today's event will be recorded and be accessible on YouTube afterwards. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to, to express my gratitude to my colleague, uh, Marcus Hetanemi for, for, Hetanen for, for helping us arrange this, and to, to Anna Jarmut for making it possible. Now, without further ado, I will give the word to Joseph. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think Hong Kong people are most grateful for the interest of the Institute in Hong Kong issues. Uh, we certainly need sympathetic voices outside Hong Kong now. My job here is to, um, to offer a brief introduction of Mr. Lee Wing Dart, a good friend of mine. He is certainly a fine example, fine representative of the first generation of pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong. He started establishing a base in New Territories West in the mid 1970s, advocating democracy through services at the grassroots level. He helped to organize and establish the Democratic Party and its predecessors. When direct elections were first introduced to the Legislative Council in 1991, he was elected and he continued to serve until 2015 with a break of four years uh, in between. He served as chairman of the Democratic Party, and he, for one time, represented the pro-democracy movement in, uh, in the campaign for the position of chief, chief, uh, chief, ex chief executive in the territory. Uh, in 2015, he retired from the uh, Legislative Council, but he certainly remained uh, active even then. Uh, he was prosecuted for his active leadership role in the uh, Umbrella Movement and was fortunate to receive just a suspended uh, sentence. Even then, we know that uh, he finds it difficult to uh, stay in Hong Kong and work in Hong Kong. And uh, last year, he left the territory for uh, the United Kingdom. <coughs> so it's natural uh, to understand that uh, with leaving that gone, uh, Hong Kong is very much a city of no opposition. So the floor is all yours, Wing Dat. Yes, thank you, Joseph. Uh, because Joseph introduced my uh, background, so I don't have to spend other one or two minutes. And uh, my, my uh, introductory statement today uh, will be in two parts. The first part uh, will talk some about the history <clears throat> of Hong Kong starting from 1980, Benin to 2018. And then the second part will be on uh, the 2019-2020 uh, movement and also the enactment of the national security laws and not the consequence. <clears throat> so um, if <clears throat> experts and also NGO representatives actually well known about the history of Hong Kong, so uh, bear with me a few minutes, maybe 10 minutes about uh, this sort uh, introduction statement. I think if Hong Kong, um, we start in the early 80s, that's uh, when the British government start to talk about Hong Kong future with Chinese government in 1982. Uh, we all remember when that time was uh, the Prime Minister, Mrs. McGrath Fletcher, went to Beijing and talked directly with uh, Deng Xiaoping. And um, at that time, uh, there's some kinds of debates where Hong Kong will go. Uh, some British official wants uh, some kind of exchange between uh, giving back the sovereign 
to China, but maintain British administration in Hong Kong. But it was rejected by Beijing authority, Beijing government. And uh, after that, British government have opted to a way, the way is simple, uh, to come with some kinds of agreement with Chinese, Chinese government, and then have some kinds of uh, guarantee in agreement that uh, will uphold the presence of all the essential elements in Hong Kong, just like uh, freedoms, uh, issue, independent kind of thing. So uh, there's a kind of debate at that time. Uh, Sometimes people ask me when I uh, go to some kinds of a forum, they ask why Hong Kong people at that time, 1982, 83, don't go to independence. My, uh, the answer to that question is that actually before the Sino-British negotiation in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong society is very apolitical in the sense that uh, people are not so interested participate in political activities. I remember when I was an uh, undergraduate in University of Hong Kong, we organized some kind of protest or worry against some unjust policy of governments. You may go to only about 50 or 100 person participate in these kinds of events. So only starting from the Sino-British negotiation, Hong Kong people start to realize that they should care about politics. So at that time, independence of Hong Kong is not a widespread discussion item in the territory. And there's actually no widespread support in Hong Kong. Uh, what the Chinese government at that time is that um, they use a very smart strategy. They pose a very open-minded uh, government. Uh, all people remember that Deng Xiaoping uh, said that they have their open door policy, uh, liberalize the economy, uh, let people have some choices and freedom. And then uh, they guaranteed the Hong Kong will become a country, uh, one country, two system with high degree of autonomy and all the system in the colonial Hong Kong will be preserved after 1997. So uh, at that time, many people will say that, oh, it's not a perfect solution, but still quite good. One country, two system with high degree of autonomy. And even then uh, being said that uh, beside foreign affairs and defense and military, all policy of Hong Kong will be decided by the Hong Kong people. So it's great in some sense. You have full autonomy except foreign affairs and defense and military. But uh, 10 years, 20 years later, you find that all these words and letters in the sino British Joint Declaration Based Law are actually not followed a lot honor by the Chinese Communist Party. So in 1984, two governments signed the treaty, the Sino-British Joint Declaration, and then the put the treaty recorded in the United Nations. If you trace back the newspaper in 1984, September, around the world, more than 100 countries, leaders will give a yes, a support to this Sino-British Joint Declaration. But uh, it's only a, a short period of time. Starting from 1985, 86, uh, 85, 86, when uh, we start the drafting of the basic law. That's mean the mini constitution of Hong Kong. We find that uh, Chinese Communist Party start to reveal the real face, the genuine face. There's always some debates about the drafting. There are always the two areas. One is about uh, what's mean by high degree of autonomy. Does it mean just like Dan Xiaoping said, beside foreign affairs and military defense, all other things are decided by the Hong people. So the people ask, do, do the political system, when the Hong Kong be, become a full democratic society, 
are decided by Hong Kong people, and then they find that no, the Chinese Communist Party said uh, they have a part to play. So they're the final say for this thing. So uh, it become a very long debate in the drafting and the people slowly find that uh, the thing they promised in joint declaration someday will not realize in very short period of time. <clears throat> then came to the, the 1989, June 4 massacre in Beijing. And uh, if the people of Middle Asia and old people, they will remember that uh, <clears throat> the Beijing students and citizens are very brave. They fight for democracy and freedom, but they are pressed down by the Chinese Communist Party with tents and also military people. At that time, Hong Kong people, just like me, uh, went to the street, one million people uh, came out of the street uh, to support Beijing people. And that's the first time in Hong Kong people afraid about Chinese Communist Party ruling because they're afraid that uh, after 1997, Hong Kong is just like another Chinese city, just like Shanghai or Beijing or Guangzhou. They will rule or fully controlled by the CCP. And in 1992, the last governor, Chris Patton, came to Hong Kong. And you can say that uh, Lord Patton is the fighter. We admire, we admire him and also we grateful to him. And uh, he tried his best and very, very great effort to push a, some kind of democratic reform in Hong Kong. Even with his strength and also the support of the Conservative Party, Lord Patton can only did a little bit. He widened <clears throat> the electoral base of the election of the legislature. But because of this reform package, the Chinese government in 1995 said that any elected elements in Chris Patton reform will be asked to step down in 1997. So I am one of them. I was elected again in 1995, but in 1997, I was stepped down. In 1997, Chinese Communist Party actually formed a, what they call a provisional legislature, a provisional parliament in Hong Kong. And all members of the parliament are appointed by the CCP. And uh, they start to change some of the laws. And uh, starting from 1998, they resumed the election, but they introduced a new method of election. They call the proportional representation. Why they do that? Because they have some scholar actually advise them. Using this system can reduce the seat of the democratic camp. So uh, although, although actually starting from 1991, up to 2016, about seven or eight times of uh, election, a democratic election of the legislature. Mm -hmm. The democratic camp always get more than 50% of the votes, five zero percent. Some that go to 60%. I think if if we, if the democratic camp <clears throat> were in Sweden or in England, actually we are the government. But in Hong Kong, the system is very strange. Democratic elements in the legislature only comprise half of the legislature. Another half uh, come from what they call functional election. Functional election in the sense that business people elect business representatives. Professional people elect professional representatives. And also, what they call, there's some small circle election. So, even we get 60% of the votes of the people in democratic election. Democratic grand people, Democrats, never get enough seats to form a government. So it becomes a very, very 
frustrating elements in Hong Kong, especially around the young people. They found that the functional group people are actually an indirect nomination people from Beijing. They always support Beijing. So from 1998 up to 2003, there were always repeated fights on the streets by public body, assembly, possession, any kind of thing, a debate in the legislature, demanding a full democratic elements in the legislature and also the election of the chief executive. But repeatedly, CCP turns on one time, two time, three time, every time, demand by the home people for full democratic legislature and election of the chief executive are turned down by the Chinese Communist Party. And 2003, the, the first chief executive, Mr. Dong Chinhua, he al always followed the order of Beijing. Under the Article 23 of basic law, he wanted to enact a law, some kind of like the national security law in 2003. And that law aroused a large response from the public, especially the NGO, human rights groups in Hong Kong, because uh, it gave a very wide range of prosecution power, prosecution power to the police and the legal department. And that led to first time and again, one million people went to the street opposed the national security law in 2003. At that time, at that year, uh, Dong Xiwa withdrew the law and uh, the law died down for a few years. And then in 2014, then uh, through this repeated call, at that time, even from the university students, we, we start the Umbera movement and also the Occupy Central movement. And um, thousand and hundred thousand people went to the street and also uh, Occupy major trunk roads in the central area for about three months. This movement they actually are led by the young people. The leaders are the young people. University students, so uh, Joshua Wong, Leighton Law, and all other famous young leaders now in uh, UK and other countries, or in prison in Hong Kong. I actually start the political fights in 2014. Then after 2014, there's no changes in political arrangement. All political changes are still controlled by CCP in Beijing. Not one step forward during five or six years. And in 2019, uh, because of a murder case uh, happened in Taiwan, uh, committed by the Hong Kong people, and the Hong Kong SAO government start to think about uh, to introduce a law called the extradition law. The extradition law in 2019 aroused very big concern of Hong Kong people because one of the clause in the extradition law said that uh, the government had power to uh, extradite people from other places back to Hong Kong to trial. And even the trial can be carried out in mainland China. We all understand that uh, mainland China is not a place with a, a what they call an independent judicial system. The courts and the lawyers and the judges are all controlled by CCP. So there's a widespread fear around Hong Kong community in 2019 that start the movement. And then afterwards, young leaders in university and also in the NGO start to organize a lot of uh, protest activists. And, and one time, two time, in mid-summer 2019, millions and millions of people walked to the street asking the governments to withdraw the law.
Um, the former chief executive, Carrie Lam, just turned a deaf ear. He just carried on and also said that he will carry on the bill on schedule and put the bill to voting in the Legislative Council. So there's a very strong reaction from the young people. So I think on this, of the 12th of June, 12th of June, 2019, there's a hundred thousand people surrounding the electrical building. And that event lead to very big fight between the police and the young people. Forces were used. Uh, the police actually uh, used tear gas. Many uh, tear gas bombs actually fired out during that days. And they arrest the young people. And also they used very unlawful method, used high br br brutality, used the baton and also rocks and also other things to hit the young people. So the reaction of the young people was very strong. Starting from that event, the young people give no hopes, have no hopes to the chief executive and also the governments. They just use force. And uh, the movement become more and more violent. The police, the police have the major responsibility because they always use force to hit the young people. The young people had to react. Sometimes you use the force back. Sometimes a small group of young people are more radical. They uh, use some kinds of uh, uh, bombs uh, flowing, uh, uh, some kinds of things to the police uh, groups. So you, you, you can remember in 2019 onwards, 2020, 2021, and uh, Hong Kong is not very, uh, we can say that it's a very unstable place because the police uh, get out every day in different areas in Hong Kong territory, Hong Kong Island, Kowloon, New Territories, from day to morning to afternoon to nighttime. And the young people and also other citizens uh, because of the grievances and anger about the Hong government, they support the young people and they go with them. And uh, that period of time, uh, there's some sources <clears throat> go to our attention that uh, CCP start think of something. The first thing is that they want the Hong police to crack down these kinds of um, public possession, assembly, and also resistance of the young people. The second is that they want to enact the national security law by Beijing, not by Hong Kong, by Beijing. So uh, we have some unverified uh, sources that at the December 2019, this was a high level, uh, very high level, CCP, Chinese Communist Party leaders meeting in Beijing, and they make a decision that uh, they support the police use force to crack down anything, just like that in 1989. And then they support the MPC, National People Congress, uh, speedily to enact a law for Hong Kong, the national security law. So in 2020, April to May, if you check the news in Hong Kong newspaper, there's some news lead out. They actually, they will have a national security law ready in June. But strange thing is that so many news talk about NSL, national security law, but there's no draft, no law draft review to the whole people. It is very strange, it's very unacceptable. In Hong Kong, we practice just like UK system. Any law, any bills in the parliament, in the legislative council, in the bill, bill, bill stage, 
you have to enact the bill. Go to public information and you should set aside three months or half year for consultation. And then the let 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 the council have a way to convey the meeting, receive public representation, and also objection. It is a very prudent method of making a law. This time, one hundred percent difference. Even May that year, two thousand twenty, no one sentence about the law review. In Beijing, or in no co pro Beijing newspaper, no nothing. And uh, Beijing did not did not accept or said he will carry out any kinds of a consultation about the national security law before enactment. So all this thing. All the enactment keep Hong Kong and the, all the international community in darkness. Suddenly, June 30, 2020, law passed. Law passed by the Beijing, law by Hong Kong legislature, no consultation. And it is that day the law passed. It's also that day the laws revealed in public on the same day. So. It is very horrible. It's the, the way CCP kept the Hong Kong people and also the international community in the dark. And after the announcement, you can say that there's a complete different atmosphere in Hong Kong. The most important uh, difference is that there's a drastic deterioration of the protection and human rights system in Hong Kong. In the past, in colonial period, when I was young in 1780, there's no democracy. But British government, colonial governments, they respect what they call freedom, judicial independence, and also press freedom. Although there's no uh, full democracy in colonial period, but the colonial government respect press of the right to report different views. The judges in the court have the independent right to make a decision on the court case. People in the society have the right to form association, NGO, political party, to raise the objection without fear, without being arrested. But now, complete difference. Why I said now Hong Kong is a city of old law opposition. I will just give a brief of that in the form six area. The first one is about uh, the freedom of expression. In the colonial period, Hong Kong is a very vibrant city. Vibrant is not in the sense of only financial investment. Banking, financial, not, not just like that. Hong Kong is a very, very beautiful place in that, uh, although if not full democracy, but in press freedom, in the formation of NGO, in the way the people, they actually can voice the opinion, in the way general people can make a phone call to public radio program, to criticize the governments, in the way the scholar in the university every day can take interview from the TV, television and radio to criticize the government policy. And all these things these people do have no fear. They will not afraid, they make strong criticisms and even ask the government to resign. They will not afraid, they were arrested by police and prosecuted by the legal department. Now what's happening? Happened is that after the enactment of the national security law, less and less people are there come out to speak. I, I checked in the past one year, there's only remain one or two academic scholars in university are there to come out to speak or criticize the government. 
in the past, maybe dozen or dozen scholar can do this. Now it's only down to one or two. And that one or two scholar tell me that they will sooner or later will left Hong Kong because uh, they cannot tolerate the atmosphere. And now the thing is that uh, in the past, you can uh, write things in the Facebook, you can uh, start a YouTube channel to criticize the government with no fear. Now, if you say something that heavily criticized, then you, you may have a possibility you will be arrested by the police and said you are against the NSL because you are inciting the people to hate the government and inciting other people to hate the government is a crime under clause of electoral security laws. So there's one case, there's a singer, a young male singer actually heavily criticized the government and he was arrested. Uh, he was on trial now, but uh, have no uh, decision now, no, uh, no decision, decision yet, but he was arrested and in jail. And also many uh, political leaders actually post many political opinion in the Facebook. They always are asked by the police to erase the Facebook pages. If they, if they didn't do that, they will be arrested and prosecuted. So this one area, nobody dare now to do this thing because the way they take the risk, easily arrested by the police and prosecuted. Second area, the freedom of association. Hong Kong, you say that it's very easy in the past. Free people go to the, what you call a society ordinance uh, authority, register as an NGO, very easy. Just send a letter and then you have a society and uh, you can uh, open your, your society, recruit member, you can as an NGO criticize the government or do all the things just like other democratic country. After the announcement of the NSL, what happened? Happened is that uh, many major trade unions, the two major trade unions, one is Confederation of Trade Union, another is Professional Teacher Trade Union. This trade union have more than 100,000 members, the two largest trade unions, independent trade union in Hong Kong. And they always not, uh, they, they will sometimes criticize the government policy. Uh, so uh, these two trade unions are forced to close down after the announcement of the NSL. How? Because uh, there's many Beijing officials in Hong Kong now. So what can they do? They will have talks with this uh, training official. And they use the word, they will very warmly remind the trade union people. If they don't close the union, the ex official may be prosecuted. So even these two training closed in last, uh, last August and September last year, and some officials are still prosecuted by the police because they're against the trade unit, union audience. And also, there are more than 60 NGO in Hong Kong. Most of them are human rights NGO in Hong Kong. And also a social orientated NGO in Hong Kong last year are closed because of the announcement of NSL. Even, even the Amnesty International, Amnesty International closed last year. Why? Because they, they, they make a statement that the Hong Kong political atmosphere and the NSL are not so easy for them to work in Hong Kong again. AI left Hong Kong last year. So uh, not only <laughs> this 60 NGO, many NGO still survive, but actually they are in some kind of very no key profile or dormant stage. Third area, the freedom of assembly of association. 
whether we have still have this right. Hong Kong in the past, uh, anybody uh, go to the street to protest, to march, if the people is under 50 people, you don't have to apply for a license. You just go out with your friends and also use the members of the group or express the concern about public policy. You don't have to apply for a license. Now, after the announcement of the NSL, uh, I read the newspaper in Hong Kong, there's actually no public possession or assembly now. The Hong government make excuse because now it's COVID. COVID. Uh, so it is not very desirable for people to come together to public possession or politic political assembly. But on the other hand, just two weeks ago, the Hong government allowed thousands and thousands of people go to a stadium to watch the international rugby seven sport competition without wearing a mask. So why the people go to the sports stadium, thousands and thousands of people are not free of COVID, but only five or six people, they want to go to March and they are not allowed. So I can give you two examples. One is about uh, in every year, I think uh, many uh, people in Sweden will uh, saw, uh, see in the news in June 5th, this is the June 4 massacre memory in Hong Kong, Victoria Park. Every year, we have 100,000 people gathered in the Victoria Park in Hong Kong, pay a remembrance to the victims of the June 4 massacre in 1989. It is an international news every year. Now, the, poli the police does not allow. It will not allow this to happen again. So I don't anticipate there's another June 4 vigil in 2023. Another thing, one example is that July this year, July 1st, there's a small political party called the Lead of Social Democrats, LSD. And uh, they want to organize a people demonstration on 1st of July this year. What they want to do, they want to express the views about democracy. They on, only want to organize a peaceful march, about 10 people on the street, distribute pamphlet. And because they renewed this act before 1st of July, what do the police do? About three or four days before the march, hundreds of police went to the chair lady home and also the home of the, of the executive. One by one, the police warned the chair lady of LSD and the ex official of LSD. They are not allowed to march on 1st of July. If they go out, they will be arrested. So the chairlift have no choice to call off the march. But even on the 1st of July, hundreds of police all follow the chair lady and also the official. They go out to the market, followed by the police, back home, followed by the police, the make friend, followed by the police. So this is one very Jenny example how the police now in Hong Kong, they just get stop all these things by using these kinds of stalking tactics, fear tactics. Number four about press freedom. Do we have press freedom now in Hong Kong? I don't think so. First of all, the mainstream newspaper, they're all pro Beijing now. The only two mainstream newspaper and uh, social media, one is Apple Daily, one is Stan New, are all closed down by the Chinese Communist Party. And Jimmy Lai, Jimmy Lai, um, the founder of the Apple Daily, arrested and in jail now for about 20 months without trial. The trial is not finished. 
and I anticipate there's a very heavy penalty to Jimmy because uh, Jimmy always stand up for freedom and also human rights and democracy in Hong Kong. And he was recognized by international community. And the second stand new chief editor and also uh, the key person in stand new are also arrested. So the key person of the Apple Daily, the key person of the stand new are all arrested now. And they're all in jail, waiting for trial and maybe waiting to jail afterwards. So uh, no, no other independent newspaper will, um, will do much about reporting news that Chinese Communist Party don't like. And uh, this appeals of information release, I think, in the middle of, the, of, of this year, when the new exec, chief executive, Mr. John Lee, come in to sit, they said that uh, they were considering to enact a new law to control social media. So they're not only control newspaper, they all, they want to control the program in uh, YouTube, other social media and all other things. Why? Because uh, they understand that uh, social media have a very widespread power in the home community. So uh, I, I anticipate they, they will enact this door in the coming one to two years. The fifth area is about police power. The police power in Hong Kong is unchecked. It's just like uh, many totalitarian governments, just like in China. In the colonial period, or even in my term in the parliament, the legislative council, I want as a member, have always the power to question the government or question the police authority if they use brutality against people demonstration or they use power unlawfully. But now, even many, many cases reveal police use unlawful power, unlawful power to stalking people, arrest people. There's no one single questions by the parliamentary now. Ask the government why they do this. No, not one question asked about why they arrest Jimmy Lai, why they stop that small political party to make a public assembly on 1st of July this year. Not one question asked. Although there's a, what they call an independent uh, uh, authority checking police power, but the members are all appointed by the chief executive and they're all very conservative. They have no checking power now. The sixth area about Hong Kong is about, there's a new political system and installed by Beijing last year. They said, the Beijing said it's a small democratic system on the election of the legislature and not the election of chief executive. But I think it is a, it is only a, 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 a kind of a PR statement. It is a backward development of Hong Kong system. Now there are more parliamentarians in the Hong Kong legislature are appointed by Beijing directly or indirectly. The democratic element in the, in the legislature decreased and uh, the majority or the members of the legislature are directly or indirectly appointed by Beijing. And even the election of chief executive this year, there's no competition. There's only one candidate. And they install a new system of nomination. I think in Sweden, in England, in France, or in other countries, they usually only all the voters can nominate a candidate to run a seat in the parliament. Hong Kong now, they install a new system. What's new system? That's, uh, they have a law ministry committee with five sector people. 
make it simple is that you have to get nomination for, from all members of the five sector. And all these five sectors are directly or indirectly controlled by Beijing. So I think even Democrats in Hong Kong, just like my former party, if they file a candidate, they will not get enough nomination and cannot be a candidate. So last year, no one Democrats, genuine Democrats actually participate in the election of the new legislature. So they just boycott the election because it's a, it's a fake election actually. And the voting rate last year is historically low. Uh, I, I want to make a brief conclusion. Uh, every time I speak to parliamentary and government officials around the world, and also people around the world, I always say this. Uh, the friends around, around the groups can help Hong Kong people because they are under the direct suppression rule of the Chinese Communist Party. First of all, uh, I hope that you more concerned about Hong Kong, uh, read the news about Hong Kong and share the news with your friends. The second, any chance you can contact your parliament uh, ask them to raise the issue um, or raise the debates about Hong Kong wherever is possible. If there's a report by your governments, then uh, make a debate about Hong Kong. So let Hong Kong become uh, more people concerned about this. And the third is that uh, if any chance that you uh, or the NGO or human rights activists in Sweden have a chance to see government, government official. Raise Ask them to uh, ask them to raise Hong Kong issue every time when the Sweden uh, or government official have a chance to meet the Chinese official. So I think that will help Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Lee. This was a wonderful, really informative lecture. I, uh, before I pass on the word to Joseph, may I uh, apologize for mispronouncing the name of my dear colleague, uh, Marcus Hietanen, of course, his name. But now no, the word is, is Joseph's. Yes, do you please show me on the screen? I have difficulty uh, placing myself on the screen. Start my video there. Anna, can you help? Okay. There you are. Yes. Hello. Can Hello. you hear me? Can yes. you see me? Yes. Lord, can we can hear and see you. Yes. Yes. For the moment, I do not see any questions yet. I guess we need a little bit of time for the audience to get warm up. I should certainly follow up uh, and uh, make use of this opportunity to seek further enlightenment from Mr. Lee. My first question is, given the fact that the pro-democracy movement no longer took part in elections, uh, what would happen to some of the members of parties like the Democratic Party, the Civic Party, and so on? Apparently, there were discussions within the Democratic Party last year before the 2021 Legislative Council elections. Uh, would this kind of discussions, would this kind of debate go on? Would these parties uh, negotiate uh, and talk to the government and spell out the terms for their participation uh, in such elections? Uh, first of all, uh, now actually two major parties, political party in Hong Kong, one is Civic Party, and that is my former party, Democratic Party. I only read the news and also the statement by the chairman of the Secret Party, Mr. Alan Learn, a uh, senior counsel, the lawyer. Uh, Alan said that if there's no young core member of the party want to take up the post of the party, then the party, the Secret Party may be disbanded maybe a, a few months later. I don't know, but uh, uh, I read from the news and also from the statement from the island. For my former party, Democratic Party, they are still can uh, 
do it a little bit. But what I understand that they're in a very difficult position. Uh, first of all, uh, all the party and NGO in Hong Kong now face a very big problem about finance. Because uh, although the, the political party uh, do not need large, large sum of money, but still they have to employ some staff, rent the place, and also some, uh, some money to spend to do some programs and projects. Now the, the Hong government and stop, have stopped all the fundraising activities of the uh, Democratic Party and also other human rights, uh, human rights NGO groups. And the second is that the uh, official actually ignore, ignore the views of this party and also NGO group. So uh, they find that they have no way to express the will. And then and, and one very crucial question Joseph asked is that whether uh, Democratic Party have debates about whether they should participate again in the election again in 2023 and 2024. I think they still in the, in the deliberation process debating about this thing. One thing is that um, it is a very problematic in the sense that um, the system now installed with a law mission committee, just like it's brief in the statement I said, in the former, in the, in the, in the former uh, legislature, legislative council members election, any candidate only need 100 citizen signature nomination then you become a candidate, very easy, very free. Now they will go for a nomination committee. You have to get the nomination from five sectors and most of them controlled by Chinese Communist Party. So what's the result? The result, if you not follow the instruction of Chinese Communist Party, they, they will not give you the nomination. But if you follow the orders of the CCP or you side with the CCP policy, for example, you Democratic, Democratic Party openly said, we support national security law. Then I don't think the general citizens will support Democratic Party again. So it is a dilemma. They have not made a conclusion yet, Joseph. Yes, we, we can certainly understand the dilemma. To put it very simply, you have to kowtow to the Chinese authorities yes. to get nomination. Yes. So <laughs> what, what is the point? My, my follow-up question is uh, out there, as you have very well explained in, in very good details, uh, the various areas of changes in Hong Kong in recent years, the uh, lack of freedom of the media, lack of the freedom of uh, assembly, association, no elections, political parties can't survive, that kind of thing. Now, how, how will Hong Kong people then articulate their grievances? Certainly they feel unhappy as reflected uh, by limited opinion surveys that they are dissatisfied with the performance of the chief executive, the top uh, civil servant, the top ministers, and so on. And Hong Kong, as you said, used to be a very vibrant city. Uh, people wanted to speak out, people wanted to criticize, they wanted to debate, to uh, engage in deliberations, discussions, quarrels, and so on. What will happen to Hong Kong people? Can, can this kind of situation last forever, or at least in the foreseeable future, when people are not allowed even to speak out their minds and to articulate their grievances, even in a peaceful manner? I think in the short term is very difficult, in the mm. sense that uh, after the announcement of the NSL, and also I think it's a very high level decision by the top Chinese Communist Party leaders, they want Hong Kong stable. Stable in the sense that a place of no opposition voices, a place have no strong opposition political party, a place of no 
strong independent media, press media. So if that's uh, the system carry on, and also with the endorsement of the top leaders in Beijing about the use of heavy police power, then it's very difficult for the activists in Hong Kong to openly to express the view. So uh, there's many friends of mine, some of the friends are sources, you also know, they are uh, released from the prison in the last few months. And uh, they also said that they have to settle a little bit. They have to, to uh, maybe uh, go to some ordinary life first before they decided what the next step. But one thing I'm very certain that uh, there's no totalitarian government can suppress the will of the people forever. I, I give you an example, just like uh, in mainland China, COVID, they all have to lock down. Last week, they start to lock down the places in Guangzhou. Two days ago, there are many community and uh, streets in Guangzhou area. The people just not obey the order of the police. Just walk down the street, pull down the barrier and uh, shout that uh, they cannot buy food, they are hungry, and they are angry about the COVID regulation. Okay, it may not be a very orderly or organized uh, way to express social unrest, but the case in mainland China give a side window for us to see that uh, even Chinese Communist Party are so heavy-handed to suppress any kinds of dissident voices. This bit and that bit, this area and that area, there's people use the way to express the grievances. I, 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 I cannot have a crystal ball to anticipate how Hong Kong will develop, but I don't think the rules now in Hong Kong can stay forever. Thank you very much. We now have two very good questions from the audience. The first question is from Mr. Tom Hart, and he raises the issue of freedom of movement. So can Hong Kong people vote with their feet? Can they, can they leave the territory? And can they return uh, at free will? And uh, what about the, uh, the wave of emigration that people talk a lot about? Uh, we would like to hear your views on this. There's also many rumors and also some uh, discussion among many uh, WhatsApp groups, signal groups, and also uh, other places. That uh, government is thinking some kinds of rules to tighten uh, the way uh, Hong Kong residents can leave Hong Kong and go back Hong Kong. But now still, there's no new laws and next inside Hong Kong governments. But uh, immigration policy in Hong Kong is highly confidential and sensitive in the sense that immigration department and also police security bureau always have no comment when press asks whether this group of people we are allowed to leave, or this group of people were allowed to go back to Hong Kong. They, they never give an answer. They only give an answer to you when you leave the gates in the airport. For example, uh, 10 days ago, uh, we understand uh, the June 12th uh, humanitarian fund, uh, Candino scene, and also Margaret are uh, the director of the fund. They are now prosecuted because uh, uh, the legal department said they are against the society audience. But the second general secretary of the fund are not arrested and not, are, are not prosecuted. So this gentleman, Mr. Choi, actually want to leave Hong Kong last week and he was arrested 
in the airport. So many people I have contact in Hong Kong, they have served the sentence in the prison and get out. And when I asked them whether we leave Hong Kong to take some rest outside, they said no. Because why? They don't know whether they will be arrested when they leave the airport. And the police and the immigration department never answer the question whether they are they were they have a black list or not. They will never answer. So Joseph, it's a very good good question, but uh, I cannot answer straight away because uh, I can only say that uh, my anticipation is the situation Hong Kong will, will deteriorate in the coming one or two years. If you have a plan to leave Hong Kong, then I think the sooner will be better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a second question, important question raised by a Mr. Marcus Heitenen. He wanted to he wanted you to comment on the long-term trends of democracy in Hong Kong, whether there will be ups and downs, and from a longer-term point of view, how will democracy uh, perhaps return to some extent to the territory, uh, would be further developed, and so on. So this is his broad question. I would like to uh, slightly uh, amend it a little bit and, and to ask you, well, the party has just had its 20th party Congress. So yeah. Xi Jinping is going to have his uh, third term at least, if not more. Uh, what are the implications for Hong Kong? Do you see some uh, relaxation? Uh, uh, at least on one hand, we see a fairly cordial meeting between Xi Jinping and President Joseph Biden recently. At this, on the other hand, most people seem to be pessimistic. Uh, they don't think that you can expect anything in the coming months and years. Uh, so what is your, your answer to, to the question of Mr. Heitenen? First of all, I think uh, the first one is a big question. Uh, I lo I'm not an academic and scholar, but I like to read books. And, uh, one thing enlightened me is that uh, in the history of the world, the, the, the words about freedom, democracy, human rights, all these works and also these sentences are actually happened in the past one or 200 years. Um, and uh, after Enlightened period in the 7th century, 18th century in Europe. That's uh, the thinking of the people more and more agree in the direction that uh, human beings should be equal. We should have that kinds of respect, sharing some common value around the world. Common value including fairness, human rights, protection, and also democracy and judicial independence, that kind of thing. And um, we have saw a wave of uh, democratization in 1991 after the fall of the USSR. And after that year, there are some ups and downs in the democratic movement in the last 20 or 30 years. Sometimes we are going up, sometimes we are going down. I, I always talk to my friends in uh, Hong Kong is that, uh, yes, Hong Kong political movements, we have put a lot of effort, but we always remember that many, many millions of people around the world, the people in Middle East, early spring in 2011, that thousands and thousands of young people died in that movement. Millions of people arrested and jailed in that movement. We still have many totalitarian government in Afghanistan, in Africa, and even in uh, China, or even in other countries. My faith in democracy is that uh, civilization 
in the past 100 years, it actually step by step move forward. But sometimes we have an up and down process. Just like uh, last year when I uh, arrived in London, I, I wrote some letter to my friends in jail. I said to them that uh, I'm a little bit pessimistic. Why? Because uh, the civilized country in Europe and other places, USA, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, India, they are not come together as one voice. They are split and divided in 2016 because of USA's new president and other pre people. They are not united. This year, I write letter again. And I said to them that this time I'm more optimistic because why? Ukraine war. Ukraine war revealed that the totalitarian government will use the force to occupy other people's places, just like Russia like to invade Ukraine. It's just like mainland China. They may invade Taiwan in the coming four or five years. So what should we do as a member of civilized country? We should come together, come together in the sense that uh, we get all the common ground together. Let the small differences aside. The small differences are small differences. Don't make it back. Then we have a united forces. Then this united alliance are strong enough to stop Russia. And this united alliance are strong enough also to stop, to stop Chinese Communist Party to invade Taiwan. So, the second question about Joseph is that after the uh, party conference, I don't think there's a major change. The only major change if we are familiar with the Chinese Communist Party uh, police structure, the top seven, the top seven leader of the Chinese Communist Party are all Xi Jinping, allies. There's no different voices now. So uh, with the very, very, uh, what, what I said, a very uh, dictate method, dictatorship method, way of governing of Xi Jinping, then I think in the future, they will use a more and more hardline policy. This time they are meeting with uh, Joe Biden, uh, President Joe Biden. It doesn't mean they will change the policy. They the only find way to do some part PR exercise and then uh, they will get the force in the military and other thing and then prepare for the invasion in Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you. I understand that Professor Loden has raised his hand. So uh, Professor Loden, would you like to uh... Uh, offer your question? Yes, I have one follow-up question, you might say. Towards the end of your uh, talk, uh, Ming Tat, you uh, said that you hope that Europeans, as other Westerners, will pay attention, close attention to what is happening in, in Hong Kong. And, sorry, I, I will... Uh, uh, towards the end of your talk, you said that you hope that we, Europeans and Westerners, should pay close attention to what is happening in, in Hong Kong and also uh, do what we can to draw the attention of our politicians to the situation in Hong Kong. A bit more specifically, what do you think, how should we relate to Hong Kong? Should we try to expand, continue and even expand trade? Now that um, we can anticipate uh, COVID-19 restrictions to be lifted, should I, as a, an old scholar, should I accept invitations to go to Hong Kong to attend conferences? Or should I rather say that under these circumstances, I refuse to visit Hong Kong? Please give some advice about how we should relate to, to to uh, Hong Kong. May, may I just yeah, uh, by saying that I, I very much uh, sympathize with your view that uh, democratic forces should unite in, uh, on these basic questions. We have our differences, but, but now our democracy in many parts of the world is threatened and then unity is very important. Please. Yes, thank you. 
Uh, first of all, I still uh, maintain my arguments that uh, if the civilized and democrat democratic country around the world united together, we still have strong enough to deter the forces in Russia and China or in any other kind of totalitarian governments if you united together. So what we do is that actually I myself treat myself as a member of the global community. I not only are concerned about Hong Kong, I concerned about Tibet, Uyghur, Ukraine, and also other countries and people. They actually under the suppression of their to the telegraph governments. Sweden is very good because it's a democratic elected government. So uh, you can give some helping point, helping hand. Uh, just as I said that uh, have some debate in the parliament, keep your friends update about the news around the group, not only Hong Kong, about Ukraine, about uh, other places that uh, you ran about the people, the women's rights, that kind of thing. That's good for the people to actually fight in that particular area. For example, I said to my friends, they understand I have did some work in London, also in other country. When they get the messages that other people around other country still pay attention about the jail in the prison, about the trial, they're very excited in the sense that they are not alone. They are not isolated. So if anyone have a chance to go to Hong Kong, that's okay, go to Hong Kong. Speak yourself. You don't have to speak very, uh, in a very terrified manner. You just speak your mind. Support democracy and freedom. You just, uh, the only thing every people should enjoy, then uh, let the government hear this voice. If there's exchange between students, let the student of Hong Kong come. Let the Chinese student come. Give them talk, exchange with them, share with them your values. Let them know even civilized and democratic country can be stable and populous and not the propaganda by the CCP. That only CCP can have a stable country and prosperous. It is a a fake information. So, so I think everyone can do something. And and I emphasize that uh, for the people, they actually they are more in a harsh situation in the prison or in Hong Kong or in Iran, Ukraine. Then in a more difficult position like us because we are live in a free society. We are not worried about arrest by the police. So we should do a little more. Let them feel we support them. Let them feel that uh, they're not isolated and alone. Thank yes, you. thank you. We now have a third question from the uh, audience from the lady Marie, Mary Annie Nainatsa. And she wants to inquire about your view of the situation of Taiwan. I guess. Uh, the uh, pressure it receives from Beijing, the uh, threats of an invasion, uh, its general support for democracy in the world and for that in Hong Kong and so on. So what, is, what are your observations regarding the situation in Taiwan, Mr. Lee? I think first of all, uh, it is very difficult, but I now more and more uh, agree to make an assessment that the uh, Chinese Communist Party may invade Taiwan in the coming five years. This is the way just like Putin did in Crimea in 2014, and then uh, in 2022 to uh, Ukraine. Because uh, 2014 is a very, very uh, easy invasion for Putin. And uh, the reaction from the Western countries is very weak at the time, that year. So Putin said that, oh, it's very easy to get Crimea, just a few months, get the whole piece of land. Why do he don't repeat the act again? 
in 2022. So it's not invasion this year. So the lesson we learned is that if Chinese Communist Party have a plan that he want to invade Taiwan, then it is the duty of all civilized countries around the world, USA, EU, Britain, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, India, Japan, South Korea. They should come together with a united front, make a concerted effort to China that if, if China invade Taiwan, all these countries will all go behind Taiwan and support Taiwan so that they have strong force backing. That's just like Ukraine now. That's uh, now they they have some kinds of uh, uh, the Ukrainian government step by step gap at the land. So uh, any kinds of uh, forward warning to Chinese Communist Party is important in the sense that the CCP have to calculate the cause of the invasion. If they don't see a united front around, around the globe of civilized democratic, democratic country, then Xi Jinping will invade. But if they're strong enough, making a very categorically commitment to Taiwan, that all these countries Civilized and democratic country will back Taiwan. Then CPU had to be calculated again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I ask the last question, please? You are now in uh, the United Kingdom. You have been there for a year and so on. What is your assessment of the uh, achievements, the activities of the Hong Kong diaspora in England and in other countries? Uh, what are their difficulties? What are their, their potential in the future? And as well as the, uh, their advocacy work and so on. So we would like to learn from you more on this aspect. First of all, I will uh, thanks uh, many governments, UK, UK government and also Sweden, uh, many UU government. Actually, they pay quite a good attention to Hong Kong issues. And uh, for our part as a exile or uh, people that left Hong Kong and settled here, uh, it is our duty and job to do our best to uh, uh, put Hong Kong issue always on the radar. I always said that segment that put Hong Kong issue always on the political radar of the parliament. And uh, there's a lot of uh, Hong Kong people now getting in England. Uh, they said about uh, now it's about 150,000. Maybe two or three years later, we're up to 300,000 people from Hong Kong. Then uh, they actually did a lot of works in different areas, some in, uh, uh, in uh, public rally assembly, some in uh, grassroots development, lab working, some in making uh, news and uh, information and uh, some in uh, cultural and also market activities to uh, block some people together. They, they are quite good, but uh, uh, we should, I, I talked to Leighton and also many other young leaders sectors, Simon, another Finn Lao, Simon, and said that uh, they should now have some planning in the sense that the EU is a big community. We will start to, work with many uh, people that resided in EU country so that they can lobby the parliament to say some group, for example, in a, a UK parliament, they have a specific group under the parliament talk about China and Hong Kong issue. If Sweden parliament, French parliament, Germany parliament, all parliament have a special group and uh, special pay special attention to Hong Kong issue. Then you have a very formal channel 
to air your view and also formal ch channel to lobby the members of parliament about Hong Kong issues. So uh, I think one thing is that, is that we, we should start this thing. And also uh, uh, because uh, the numbers of uh, Hong Kong people now in uh, UK steadily grew up. Some of the young people thinking about whether they should participate in some local election. So I think it's a good sign before they want to integrate with the UK politics. So, so I think there's many direction of development and uh, they are going in the good sign. Thank you. Thank you. I think we all enjoy a very insightful, very fruitful session. And uh, before we end, I would like uh, Professor Loden to say a few words on our behalf. Thank you, Joseph. And thank you, especially to Mr. Wintert Lee. This has been a, an extremely informative session, an extremely informative lecture. I, and I'm sure the others who have listened to this talk and who will do so later, all admire you for your tireless work. As a Swede, I hope that we, Swedes, and also uh, people in other European countries and other democratic countries uh, will do more than we have so far to promote the cause of freedom and democracy in Hong Kong. Of course, the situation in different countries is different. The UK has a special relationship with Hong Kong. And mm -hmm. so very many Hong Kongers have now uh, found refuge in the United Kingdom. Very few people come to Sweden, and I would very much like to see our authorities uh, welcome more people from Hong Kong to come here. For instance, by sure. me inviting students to come here. Yeah, 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 yeah. But also in other ways. Uh, anyway, again, uh, the situation now looks, uh, doesn't look good at all. But one perception I have is that if we look at the world situation, democracy has been on the retreat now for, has been, has suffered serious setbacks during the last past couple of decades. And this may make us pessimistic, but to an extent, maybe this uh, re repression, this strengthened uh, authoritarianism, the return of totalitarianism to China, maybe this can also be seen as a response to the democratic wave that we experienced for a while. I think that the democratic wave that prevailed for a while after the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, really seriously threatened authoritarian rulers all over the world, not least in China, that they realized that, that this democratic wave posed a serious threat to their continued rule, rule and therefore they have uh, uh, strengthened, try to do what they can to strengthen their rule. But this will probably pass. I mean, the, the, as you said yourself, the development is going back and forth. And I think we must must cling on to the hope that that uh, the democratic uh, wave, the wave of, of democracy and freedom, will again uh, gain force in the future. So, uh, finally, let let me express my deep gratitude to you, Mr. Lee, for for sharing your thoughts with us, and also thank you, Joseph, very much for. Oh. No, 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 no. moderating this event in such a masterful manner. May I finally also uh, remind you all that on the 25th of November, the China Stockholm China Center at ISDP will organize a mini conference, you could say, a digital conference uh, entitled Contemporary Hong Kong-Taiwan Relations in the Shadow of the People's Republic of China. Yeah, I, I think this, we, we can look forward to an interesting day on the 25th of November. And so I wish you all uh, most welcome back then. And Mr. Lee, I hope that we can also continue our cooperation. Yes, yes, yes. All the yes, best yes. of luck to you. And, and Thank you. Thank you to the audience. Thank you. Thank and you. Good. Thank you. Thank you.